Hey everybody, my name is Addie Broyles. I'm the founder of Don't Fear the Death Card, a tarot and ancestral healing practice based in Austin, Texas. I am so excited to be giving you this workshop today through Wise Skies. Uh, and please check out the podcast that Tiffany and I are recording about this subject. I hope that it will unlock many conversations for you in your own life and hopefully expand your own spiritual practice. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about me and I'll tell you then about my work. So I am a former food writer. I've been a journalist for a long time. Um, but all along those years when I was a writer, uh, I am still a writer, but all those years when I was a writer, um, I was telling stories about my life, my family. I was a food writer, so I could use food as a way to expand how we view the world. So if I could look at your family recipe, I could probably learn a little bit about how you lived, where you lived, what mattered to you, um, a little bit more about your family life. So all those years as a food writer got me thinking that maybe things aren't always as they seem in the stories that we tell. Um, I found that when I would interview people who had never been interviewed for an article before, they were surprised at the details I was interested in about their lives. And I think that that really applies to this ancestral healing business because we start asking questions, not from a place of judgment, but from a place of observation. And that gentle curiosity that I think writers bring to the written word, I think we all can bring to uh, the stories and the narratives we have about our lives and the ways that we inquire about who were the people who came before us? How can we take what we want and what, we, what is generative from those people to pass on to future generations? And what do we want to leave behind? I think all of my tarot and ancestry work is related to my social justice work. As a white person, how do I um, name the privileges that I have and, and that my ancestors have had while making and working towards a more just future for everyone? Um, I, an important book of, that's been part of my practice is called Emergent Strategy, and I encourage everyone to check that out. Um, it's written by a woman named Adrienne Marie Brown and uh, talks about what can we learn from nature as we um, think about the system in our lives right now as we um, also think about everything that we change changes us. Uh, she bases a lot of her work in Octavia Butler. So a lot of this idea of how do we imagine the future? What is the future I imagine for my ancestors? The seven generation work, seven generations before and seven generations after. If I can have reverence for and curiosity about that span of time, both before and after, that is how I know that I'm taking up the a right sized space for myself and that I am showing up for my life with the kind of energy that I think I'm destined to have and to bring to my life. It's, it, I'll, I'll get into the more specifics of how tarot works into all of this, um, but I want to give you my general ideas about ancestry before we get started with the tarot part. So um, I found this quilt in a trunk in my mom's house in Missouri several, maybe 10 years ago. Um, I might have been shown it whenever I was a child, but I don't remember. But all I remember is um, smelling it because it smelled awful, like rotten mothballs. Um, and I looked at the back at the stitches and I thought, oh my God, look at this hand stitch. I didn't even really, I didn't know how, how to quilt at the time, but I knew a little bit about sewing. And I saw these stitches and I could imagine the hands of the woman, one of my forebears, stitching this quilt. Um, but we didn't even know which one. Um, and my family cares a lot about ancestry and legacy and story, but somehow this particular story had been lost. And I felt something um, deep inside of me shift to say, this is for you. This is a puzzle for you, for you to pick up and go find the rest of the puzzle, go find the rest of the pieces that haven't been put together. So um, I put this, I took it from Missouri, brought it to Texas, put this in my fabric stash. I washed it so it could at least get some of the smell out. And then I put it away and I didn't think about it for years. Many years went by, um, both my grandmother and my father died, um, one about five years ago and the other about three years ago, very painful losses. And during the course of those, the, those grieving moments, that grief, learning how to carry that grief, I started thinking more about this quilt and I started thinking more about ancestry. I think it's natural that when people go through cycles of death and life, because um, you know you don't have one without, without the other, uh, that we start looking at our roots and looking at the quality of our roots and how 
deep our roots are and how interconnected and are they nourished and what nourishes them. And I found out really quickly that my roots feel nourished when I'm in direct contact with my ancestors. That was what was so beautiful when I started practicing tarot was that my tarot teachers instructed me to think about my well and chosen ancestors when I pull cards. So anytime I have a deck of cards in my hand, I have open hands and an open heart for the messages of my well and chosen ancestors. So well and chosen ancestors, that's an important distinction as we're working, we're doing any type of ancestry work because not all of us have well ancestors. Not all of us know anything about our ancestors. Um, many of us have, you know, very difficult parts of our family trees, shadows, um, lost branches, trees, parts of our family tree that never got a chance to fully bloom because of death or, or any type of challenges or um, abandonment, you know, on my family tree, there are, there are huge parts of the tree that are just missing. My dad didn't know who his dad was. That is a huge part of one's family tree to be missing. But no matter what your family tree looks like, there are branches and leaves and trunks for you to explore. And there are safe places that I think are, are asking for you to come and explore. So before you even get started, before we get started any further, um, let's take a moment wherever you are, maybe you're sitting with a, a quilt in your lap and a pen in your hand and you're taking some notes and getting curious about your own ancestry and how you can work with your ancestors and just call out to them. Think about the folks who loved on you when you were little, when you were in school, the teachers, maybe you had a school nurse or a piano teacher or a volleyball coach or a neighbor or you have a best friend who's your brother from another mother. Think about that person. Think about the people back and back and back whose names you don't even know, who did not have the comforts that you have, and who perhaps eked out lives with very little. Maybe you had, maybe you had family members who were royalty, and maybe they weren't eking out little, but maybe they had spiritual lives that they didn't have access to the, this dialogue. Um, people who braved leaving churches or leaving continents or leaving abusive husbands. There are many people in every tree and in every tree people have survived and they have thrived and they have um, done their part to contribute to the wellness of the family. And those are the people that we want in this space. The unwell ancestors, we will tackle them later on, but for now we're bringing the well ancestors into the space. And think about those chosen ancestors, those people that you're not related to, but that had a profoundly um, impactful role in your development as a young person or as an adult, an adult today. So as you're thinking about them, I was doing that with my tarot cards in my hand. That's how I start every tarot reading. And what I ask is, ancestors, what do you have for me today? What would you have me know? What would you have me look at? I don't use tarot cards to foretell the future. I don't ask cards questions about, should I quit this job? Should I have this baby? It is, what, what should I know right now? What should I be looking for? What messages do you have for me? For some folks, it's enough for them to make that prayer to their higher power. For me, it's not enough. I really need this connection with my ancestors, my well and chosen ancestors. And so those are the questions that I ask. And usually I'll do a three card spread. And the first card is, you know, ancestors in universe, what will you have me look at right now? The middle card is um, what's hidden underneath this? What is the, the deeper truth to that first card? And then the last card is, what is the healing and the medicine that I should turn to in this moment? And, and I use those cards to help me answer the bigger questions of, oh my gosh, what do I do about this thing? Um, but it's a, a moment of reflection and, and encouragement to ask questions that can cause me to reveal parts of myself that I am not able to see right now without the cards. So that's how the cards in the ancestors start to interact. But I wanna give you some ideas about how you can deepen your ancestral practice no matter if you use tarot, you might just be interested in um, just the ancestral healing part without the tarot. I'll try to give you different options um, so that it'll work for you no matter where you are in your practice. 
Okay, so now that we have our ancestors in our mind, feel free to pull some cards if you would like to. Um, I'm not going to pull a card right now, though, but I will at the end. That visual of your ancestors joining you could be sitting at a table. It could be going on a walk. It could be embracing you. That's the first step is feeling safe enough to, to do this work. And if you're not feeling safe enough to do this work because you have such a conflicted uh, relationship with your ancestors, and maybe you can only just think of one, just think of one person who showed you that unconditional love and you can start there. So sometimes I'll make lists, I'll write all of their names down. Sometimes I will, um, this ancestry work really comes alive for me when I'm going through old photo albums or if I'm having to clean out a closet, I'll often take a photo with my phone of the hard copy photos just so that I can have a backup. I'm always thinking about making sure that um, I'm leaving a footprint so that there's not just one thing that connects me to a certain person or there's not just one copy of a photo. That's just a little side note. Um, and what's so great is that you can start to um, using modern technology, start keeping track of your ancestors in a way that they couldn't. So back in the day, I had some ancestors who were interested in genealogy and they would go courthouse hopping, courthouse to courthouse looking at records. We don't have to do that anymore. You can get a free ancestry account and start keeping track or building a family tree in a digital format. That's pretty cool. It's not for everybody. Not everybody loves sitting on a computer doing that kind of ancestry work, looking at um, you know, you can get like a free, like paid try, you know, like do the 14 day thing on ancestry. That's why I first start, started doing it. <clears throat> I was able to build a family tree of about 300 people just over the course of a weekend because they offer you so many clues by, by typing in names. Um, it'll, it can actually find great, great grandparents that you don't know about. And so that can be really helpful too, as you're starting, if, if you're, if you're uncertain with sort of what your tree even looks like, because what we're trying to do is just get a big picture view of, um, you know, where are the, the warm parts of my tree and where are the parts of my tree where there was some trauma and where we are trying to heal the family dysfunction that has been passed down and now resides in our body. So in my family, we have had um, many generations of alcoholism and codependency. And when I was a kid, I always heard, be careful, don't drink too much, you might become an alcoholic. Nobody ever said, don't try to control other people so much or you'll become a codependent. And ultimately that's what happened. So in my therapy and self-healing work around codependency, I've had a chance to look back and think about the addiction that really derailed many, many family members, many, you know, a long time ago. And when I was a kid, I would hear family stories and I would hear a hint of pain. I would hear somebody repeat the same way to talk about someone else in the family that indicated that that healing had not happened yet. I'm not here to do this ancestral healing work for them to heal that gap. I'm making the, I'm making these strides so that I can heal the fractures with people around me now so that my own kids and my community can see what an amends looks like, what they can see, um, they can see what uh, radical forgiveness and detachment looks like, what, what love looks like. I mean, I have a whole new idea about what love is now as an adult than I did when I was a new mom. And I was really caught up in the enmeshment that I had learned from my mom and my grandmother, and they were doing the best that they could, but they passed that down as much as my curly hair. So when you start to think about, um, you know, where those life-changing moments were in your lineage, make note of those, either, you know, pen and paper in a digital format in your mind. In my mind, I have a couple of, you know, they were, they're real forks in the road where, um, you know, my dad was raised by his grandmother and nobody told him until he was 30 years old that he had, that his, the woman who he thought was his mom was actually his grandmother. I can now see in my family why secrets were not allowed whenever I was a child. Secrets were not okay because my dad was still trying to heal from the fact that he, something so deep had been withheld from him. And so anytime something around secrecy comes up, I know that in my tree, I have a scar. I have a wound that I am 
consciously tending so that I can heal and it can become a beautiful scar that helps make me unique, but that is, that is not a pain that, that defines my current life. But what I recommend people to do is as you are looking at this landscape and you're starting to think about the great grandmas and the grandmas and the people you've heard about and the people you knew well and the people that you thought you knew well until something changed, um, you can't take on all of that ancestral healing at once. So just start with one. Um, I, my, 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 I would say the first ancestor that I really did this work with was my grandmother who I was so close with. This is her necklace that I fished out of her jewelry box whenever she died. Um, I love talismans from ancestors that, that are a physical way for me to be connected with them. But what I started doing with my grandmother specifically was, um, you know, she would be the first person that I would think of. And I would start to connect her to different attributes in the tarot deck. Um, she is a Taurus. Her birthday is in May, um, which is connected to the Hierophant card. And so when I pull the Hierophant, I think about um, finding new structures of knowledge and new ways of being in the world and having the courage to withstand the contraction of the five. My grandmother's life was full of contractions and unexpected things. And you know she bore the brunt of, uh, of, of other people's decisions and she didn't get much agency in her life until much later. And, uh, you know, she was also racist. She wasn't explicitly racist to people outside of her bridge club, but I caught wind of some of that. And being willing to question what you know and to hold reverence for teachers who also weren't perfect, I think that's part of the medicine of the Hierophant. Every ancestor that you're gonna have this conversation with, it will be a different dialogue. You can look at their birthdays, if you can look at, um, you know, you could do their whole astrological charts if you wanted to. You could um, look at the 16 personality types. There's this really great, um, I'll put this in the show notes or wherever I can share some information with you. Um, some great work that's been done around the Myers-Briggs personality types and the 16 court cards of the tarot. So you might literally have people in your family that you start to associate with certain cards. Um, I do this with public figures. So when Sidney Poitier died recently, I immediately associated him with a king of wands. You know, this man stood for his principles. He, he, he had such a commanding leadership with his calmness, but he was still so aflame. You know, he, he knew how to have that fire burn within him without burning down the village. And to, to be able to hold that tension, he does that better than anyone else that I can think of. I am not related to Sidney Potier, but I do not have a King of Wands in my family right, that I can think of right now. But how important is it for me to think about who, what, what roles did the people in my family play? And as I assemble my own whole family in my mind, leaving room for mentors, and role models who I'm not actually related to. And, and again, I, I humbly as a white person suggest and can could also be proven wrong that I think it's, it's healthy for us to be thinking outside of our race when we do this work. Um, you know, an early person that I really looked up to as a young person was Laura Ingalls Wilder, who I now see to be very problematic. But as I think about my well and chosen ancestors, um, I have the same feelings about Laura Ingalls Wilder, Wilder that I do my alcoholic great grandmother who became sober but never found a recovery program. So was a, she was essentially a dry drunk who did continue to do harm even while she was a changed person and was raising my dad and gave him many of the, the great things that she ultimately gave him. She was a flawed person who, who also left some things for me that I get to take and I get to treasure. So that's a little bit about how the tarot can start to um, change how you think about some of your ancestors. I think our ancestors also change how we think about the tarot. Um, you know, if we have healthy relationships with maternal figures in our family tree, we might not have an, a hard time uh, working with the empress or um, any of the queens or any of the other more um, feminized 
effeminate. I'm, you know, listen, I try to bring as much non-binary stuff as I can to the tarot, but I do think that there's divine feminine and divine masculine out there. So if you have a healthy relationship with your divine feminine side, those cards are going to come easier to you. The divine masculine, if you have had some struggles with masculine figures in your own life, that might be where you feel called to do some of that work first. Okay, so you are starting to think about the landscape of your family. You're starting to think about the relationships between these I mean, listen, there's a whole field of study called ancestral constellations. And this is a, a little bit in line with that, where you think about the, the vastness of your sky and how um, objects, they, they look like they stand alone, but no one lives on an island. And every single person in your own constellation is influenced by and affected by its relationships to others in that constellation, but most importantly to you. Because wherever you move, how you see those ancestors are going to change. And so the ancestral healing work that you do at one point in your life will be very different than at another point in your life. But I think if we carry this with us almost on a daily basis and we, we start a dialogue with our ancestors, it's not something we do once and then we're finished. Um, so here are some day-to-day -day things that I think you can do to bring this ancestral healing into your life. The first one, take your favorite ancestors and put their birthdays in your calendar. Make it as a repeating event so every single year you get reminded of when your ancestor's birthday is. Some people are good with remembering birthdays, other people are not. Find a way to remember when your ancestors were born and celebrate them. When that day rolls around, pull out your cards, say, I, dearest ancestor, or even a living ancestor. It was my uncle's birthday a couple of days ago. What an awesome gift to him to pause and take and, and pull some cards and ask the universe and my, my well and chosen, our well and chosen ancestors, my uncle and I, is what, what role does Uncle Chris have in my life? You know, what does he have to show me? Oh my gosh, this is so great. I just decided I would start pulling cards now. I pulled the three of pentacles. Chris, my uncle that I was just talking about, has always been a wonderful teacher in my life, and he is a marvelous student. He shows me again and again his willingness to learn and his eagerness to be engaged in the learning process and his ability to stand tall in his teacher energy when he needs to be a teacher and knows when to relinquish that and to become the student. And that's what I think the beauty of that card holds is that facility between going back and forth between the teacher and the student. Um, so birthdays, tarot pulls, first thing for you to do. Second thing for you to do, find an object, any object or a photo and put it out. Put a photo of your ancestor on your desk, your favorite one, some of your favorite ones. If you don't have a photo of your favorite ancestor, make a piece of art that makes you think of them. If you don't have any photos of them or, or you don't have any ancestors that you like at all, find a picture of Betty White, put her in a frame and think about her as your great, great granny. <laughs> this is, she's such a great example of someone who did not have children. Yet how many people feel a sense of connection to her that one might call ancestral, especially now that she has passed. How beautiful to pause and honor her reverence as an auntie who encourages you and tells you to be you and to not take no crap from nobody. <laughs> so when you're watching YouTube clips in mourning of Betty White, it doesn't make any sense to um, try to make that small or say, oh, you didn't know her. You're not sad. That's not true. When you watch those videos, you have the power of the story to put yourself in reverence at her feet and let her love on you, even from beyond the grave. And that's what I feel when I take find objects like an unfinished quilt and decide, you know what, I'm going to dedicate some time to this object and to learn more about it. Now, again, the privilege really comes up, the fact that um, my family, my, that my ancestor even had the time to quilt this thing in the first place and didn't sell it, um, or that she had access to the fabrics. I mean, there's just privilege on top of privilege on top of privilege. Even though my, my ancestors were immigrants, 
um, which I'm going to talk about here in a second. Um, but the, I just want to name that that is such a huge privilege, the privilege that I have to even do this work. Um, you know, this is in some ways top of the, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but it also feels so foundational. So I finally pulled this quilt out because I was ready to do some ancestor work around this part of my tree. And I said, I want to finish this. So I um, started doing all the things that you need to do to finish quilt. And um, as I was doing it, I, before I even started, I laid this quilt out and I just literally laid down on top of the quilt and I meditated and I had a moment of connection of prayer to literally call out to my ancestors, please work with me and um, come into this space with me as I work on this piece of this, this piece of fabric. Um, help me honor your intention. Help, listen, my ancestors might not have even had an intention for their quilt, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> this is what's so great about ancestry work. I get to imagine that story and let it be loose and let it be flowing and let it be changing. So what happened as I started working on this is I started looking for information about um, when these fabrics came out. I tried, I was trying to date it. I was trying to figure out if it was my great grandmother or my great great grandmother because I knew they both liked to sew. Um, and that just took me down this huge rabbit hole of looking around on the internet, learning more about feed sack fabric. I actually wrote um, uh, an essay about this on a platform that I write to called The Feminist Kitchen. It's a sub stack. It was a blog for a decade before I moved it over to a newsletter. So if you go to thefeministkitchen.com, you can see more photos of the quilt and read this whole essay I wrote about reconnecting with my Swedish roots through this quilt. But I'm giving you sort of, sort of the shorthand version here. Um, but I found out that basically where they were living in the Midwest was like where feed sack fabric was born. Literally the patent for feed sack fabric was in Missouri. They, they were in Missouri right around that time. They actually lived right next to the railroads in Springfield, Missouri, where all the feed mills were distributing these huge bags of grain, but also flour and sugar. The more I looked into this, I was able to think about the hardships of being in the 30s. Uh, I was able to think about what my, so this, this ancestor, the great, great grandmother, yes, I have a tattoo. This is how much I love ancestral healing. I got it on my grandmother's birthday. You also can get ancestral tattoos too, but you know, I'm a little extra when it comes to the ancestors. Um, this is the island uh, off the island, uh, off of the coast of Sweden where my uh, great great grandmother immigrated from. These are the types of things you find out when you just start paying attention to the little clues on the documents. Um, little did I know that my grandmother, before she died, th thankfully before she died, we had this conversation. Uh, and I was asking her more questions about this particular ancestor. She had been the keeper of the, the family story, right? She also had in a manila envelope, her immigration documents. And listen, she pulled those out and I took photos of them immediately. And it unlocked clues that eventually led that, to a trip that my sister and I took to Gotland where she lived. So this is the culmination of this work. Like I'm kind of getting ahead of myself about like, I'm trying to give you the practical things that you can do in your day-to-day -day life to connect with your ancestors. But ultimately this might put you on an airplane or on a boat, or you might end up being in the middle of nowhere that you have never been to, but you know that one of your ancestors was there at some point and you feel called to go. Answer that call. If you are feeling like your ancestors are nudging you to go do a trip like that, you will not regret it. My sister and I uh, went to where our ancestor came from in Sweden before my grandmother died. We didn't have the money to do that. We had young children. That was not necessarily, you know, it wasn't like that was an easy trip for us to take, but we insisted on going before my grandmother died. And I can remember FaceTiming her from Sweden. And it was just, you know, my, my sweet grandmother, I think she was really proud and happy that we went but you could tell it was not vibrating in her bones in the same way that it was my sister and I. So um, maybe you too will find yourself at a Lutheran church in a village of no more than 10 people weeping, thinking about the fact that your ancestor had walked through those doors 150 years ago. Those clues don't just fall into your lap, though. I mean, you have to take, this is what I mean by um, when you reach out to the ancestors, information starts coming to you that can lead to these kinds of experiences. And if every day your tarot practice starts with 
ancestors, I invite you into this space, you, you will be attuned to clues that lead you down that journey. So I was attuned to the clues while I was researching this quilt about what it would have been like for a you know first generation Swedish American woman in the 1930s to be raising two small children. And then, um, you know, I had known that that particular ancestor's husband had walked out on her family. And, um, but in the course of putting together this quilt, I just really developed so much more compassion and empathy for what she went through, which therefore made me have more compassion for what my grandmother went through and therefore what she passed on to my mom and what I got. And I could not be as critical as I have been of both my mom and my grandmother who were, you know, are two of my, you know, closest female relatives. Um, but it just allowed me to start changing that story and allowed me to appreciate how far people come, even when they don't meet our standards, they have probably been dealing with, thing, with things that we couldn't even see. Um, my next hope in this, my own personal journey, just as a quick little side note, is um, that ancestor, so my great-great-grandfather who left the, the family, he had two more children who um, whose names were not even recorded by my family because there was so much bitterness and anger. And I, it's the 21st century, enough time has passed. If those folks, I'm ready and willing to reconnect with that part of my family, right? And so at, at another point, I will be doing even more detective work to try to locate some of these other family members. Um, because this, I think, is how we feel whole to get to the why of why do this work? Why take these um, adventures, either literal adventures or just computer adventures or courthouse adventures? Maybe you want to go and dig around into the records and try to find some information about your family. What do you get out of that? There's a real sense of wholeness that comes when I learn to embrace the past and the present the life and the death, the time that I had with my father and the time that I now have without him that is gloriously rich because I turned toward the grief and I turned toward these unknowns and these uncertainties knowing that there would be something rich and beautiful for me waiting because my curiosity my curiosity is a, is a gift from my higher power. My curiosity is something that I inherited from my ancestors. And if you had that curiosity too, what a better way to honor them than to feed that curiosity. And I don't know about you, but my curiosity gets fed with each new piece of information I find. And a lot of times I just store it up in my head. Sometimes I put it on paper. Um, when I work with my tarot clients, I have them write letter. My ancestry clients, I have them write letters to their ancestors. I have them. Um, uh, have rituals around it, especially again, those birthdays are really important. Marriages and anniversaries are really important. Um, you know, making it a ritual, celebrating Day of the Dead. I'm um, it, during the Halloween season, the, the thinning of the veils uh, is, is very true. I feel it. I've always felt that. Um, and, you know, I, I still don't know. I can make some educated guesses about the um, the witchy practices that my ancestors might have uh, participated in in Scandinavia 2000 years ago. It, who knows if they were around bonfires and celebrating Samhain or, or things like that. That's more for me to learn, you know? But in the meantime, I am going to connect with nature, connect with these cycles, connect with those parts of myself um, so that I can receive these, I think, divine downloads from the ancestors. Okay, as we come to the last part of our class, I wanna encourage you to go to cemeteries. I know this is gonna sound maybe not creepy. I don't think so. My company is called Don't Fear the Death Card. You wouldn't be in this workshop if you weren't curious about death. I think cemeteries are special places. I think it doesn't matter where they are. It doesn't matter who's buried there. It is a rite of passage that too often, myself included, I just drive by them and I don't think twice about them. 
Um, I think there's a lot of healing that can happen in cemeteries. I think if you know where your loved ones, your well and chosen ancestors are buried to make a point to go and visit those graves is very important. I think it's so important to take young people to funerals. Um, my kids have been to more funerals than I can count. They, we talk about death. I very much think about my own grief journey as being in, uh, tied to my parenting journey. When I was pregnant with my oldest, my, my very best friend in the whole world died unexpectedly. And um, my kids know his name. They know his birthday because every year I talk about it, you know? Um, but in the past few years, I have actually been interested in going to graves because I, I live in Austin. I actually don't know anybody who's buried here. No one. None of my family or ancestors is buried in Austin. But that doesn't mean that I don't have profound experiences when I take some time, go to a cemetery, and just walk around. And um, particularly, I love doing it um, like the older, you know, if you can go to, well, all so much cemeteries have old graves, but when you go to graves and you start looking back at um, the birth years and the death years, um, you start wondering who's missing. You start thinking about the Black cemeteries that have are only preserved because of a small group of people who are keeping them going. They don't have the city resources behind them. You start thinking about the injustices that some of the people who are buried might have caused. Um, and you know that really starts to, to get into what work can we do in our own family trees when we find out that we are descended from slaveholders or racists or people who abandoned their families or people who fill in the blank. Learning how to stand at a grave and feel that tension come up and to hold space for that. I just think so much growth can come when I was at a cemetery in Austin recently and I recognized some of the names just because the streets are named, you know, there's some streets that are named after these people or, you know, rec centers or, or, or even neighborhoods. And I thought, because, you know, I don't want to make judgments about some of these people I don't know if they were white racists. Some of them, I could make some assumptions, but to be able to thank them for perhaps what they did leave on this city, you know, I, I, I live in a thriving city that is imperfect, just like me. And, it, you know, there's a lot of deep psychological work that comes from being able to um, have some distance between the past and the present and people that you don't want to associate with and the people that you do. But I think it's really important to be able to look at it rather than always be looking away. If we are always looking away from the things that we don't like, they don't go away, they don't disappear. And when I interviewed my 94 year old uncle the other day about this quilt, my grandmother's brother is still living, you know, having the courage to actually call up a living ancestor I mean, he's the oldest person in our, he's the oldest person to have lived in our family that I know of that, uh, you know, according to our family tree, nobody's lived to be more than 94, but I don't actually have a close relationship with him. I mean, turns out that he and my, he and my grandmother had his wife and my grandma had had a falling out in the late fifties. And by the nineties, we still felt it because there were certain things that my grandma wouldn't talk about. There were certain, we just didn't see this side of the family for a long time, but he's still alive and I have his phone number. And so I called him and I said, Uncle Jack, tell me about your mom. What do you remember about your grandma? And bless his heart, he's old. He tells some of the same stories over and over again. And I had to kind of sometimes pull him back to what I was interested in, but I also just had to listen to what he wanted to tell me. Um, and then also kind of encourage the conversation back to um, the quilt and his mom. But that's why I think what it means to be a good ancestor is to have that patience, to listen to what our ancestors want us to hear. And sometimes, the, sometimes they're over there just blabbing and that's okay too, because our ancestors are imperfect and it's not like they become miraculous people after they have died. You know, people have asked me, do I, do I, do I actually think that my ancestors are, are like alive in another place? Do I, I think that they are all, like having some sort of party just waiting for me to come. I don't know. Some days I do, some days I don't. I think that that is always gonna change. And I think it's kind of a fun mental experience to think about. And I would encourage you to do that too. Um, regardless of 
if you're religious or spiritual, you know, think, you know, what, what does happen after we die? Maybe nothing. Maybe all of this is just our way to cope with living. And I think that's okay. I think it's actually pretty beautiful. So I called up Jack and I got him to tell me what he remembered about the family. We got around to his dad and he could barely speak the words about his dad leaving. And I could hold space for that pain. And I could think about abandonment in my own life. And I could think about how important it is for me to go and try to find that ancestor's grave at some point. So I could stand on that grave, not in, in a disrespectful way, but to say, you too were doing the best that you could. Listen, that is not a well and chosen ancestor who gets invited into the room. When I'm doing tarot, mm -mm. but eventually that's where this ancestral healing gets you is the ability to, with the people who disappoint you in your day-to-day -day life today, what do you do with that? How do you handle abandonment? How do you handle, um, how do you handle death? How do you handle unexpected loss? How do you handle parts of your family tree that, that didn't get to grow as long as they should have? How do you see the intertwining of your friends in that tree. My, my son loves to talk about our family tree, the friend and family business, right? He said, it's like the family tree, but the friends are the vines that grow up in between all the branches. And so at some point you could do this work with those friends who are in your tree too. And I guarantee you, it will change how you interact with them. It will change how you think about holidays. It will change how you spend your quiet time. And I think it will make you think differently as you are going through the world, thinking about how history informs the future in every aspect of our society. Because if we pay attention to this on a personal level and we do this kind of work just in, intrinsically, internally on the weekends, on Christmas breaks, I think that means that we'll be able to, to make some changes in our world that really need to happen. Because if we just operate as if the only thing that matters is today, is what's happening today, what's happening with my kids today or my mom today or the people who are living in my life today, I feel like that really flattens the experience of being a human on this earth. And if I want there even to be an earth for my kids, you know, they're 14 and 11 now, in another 50 or 60 years, I might not even be here. What kind of a world do I want them to live in? I want them to live in a world where they still think about the people who were alive in the 1800s and the 1900s and then the 2000s, and that they realize that they are part of a legacy where we are weaving together this beautiful story, this beautiful fabric, this beautiful quilt. This quilt is such a good metaphor for the ancestral healing because look at all these different patterns that don't tip, they don't match. They don't necessarily look like they go together. Each one is unique in their own way, but they all fit together. And they together make something that's much, much stronger than any one of them. And it's so easy to feel like I, you know, we're, we're islands, right? Like I can just live in my world. I can live in my little house and my little bubble and, and nothing matters because one day I'm going to die. That's true for everybody. And it has always been true. But what if my, my little one life and your little one life and the people who came before us lives and the people who come after us lives, what if, what if we're stitching together and we're creating not a 2D, but a 3D creation? This is just so beautiful to me. Anyway, so I hope that this has inspired you to do some ancestral healing work this year, to pick up your cards, to um, start asking maybe some different questions of your ancestors and of your tarot deck. Again, tarot, tarot is optional in this process. Um, but to conclude, let's do a full spread. Um, I'm going to pull one for Esther. I'm probably going to cry because I actually have not done this yet. <laughs> All this talk I've, I've done about the quilt, I have not actually done a full spread for her. So let's see. Um, let's see how this comes. Thank you guys for being here today. 
Um, I really do hope you've enjoyed this. If you would like to stay in touch with me, you can find me at don't fear the death card on Instagram or at Broyles A, uh, B R O Y L E S A, uh, which is my Instagram handle. Funny note about that. Um, my dad, I told you, was um, raised by his grandmother. So basically, my last name comes from someone I'm not biologically related to. Um, he was just married to my great great grandmother for a short period of time. He was an abusive asshole. I've got ancestry work to do on that man, but that's where my name comes from is somebody that I'm not even by biolo- Well, my, I'm biologically related to my dad, but my dad is not related to the Broyles name. Um, but you know, I feel really proud of my name because I re- feel really proud of my dad. And I'm, I'm glad I kept my name. I'm getting married this year. Don't plan on changing my name. Love my name. Okay. So we got the tears all warmed up. I got, I'm feeling the energy in my body. I've got this beautiful late afternoon sun got my Rider Waite deck and um, I'm inviting my ancestors into this space, um, especially Esther Anderson, born in 1898, died in 1959 on Easter Sunday um, of kidney failure. She was, uh, was it 61 years old, 60 years old, something like that. Um, bless you, Esther, for everything that you um, endured in your life. And thank you for leaving me this quilt. It was a real honor to finish it. What do you have for me to look at today? What do you have for me to look at, Esther? Um, And then the second card will be what's underneath that. And then the last, um, what's the medicine and the teacher for the next little while, whatever that means, (laughs) the next part of my life, the rest of my life. Okay. Wow, okay, so. Me, these are sliding, so I'm gonna put them over here. First card, Page of Swords. So this is an interesting one. Um, Page of Swords is, I love the naivete of the swords. It's the, why are things like this? And I can, I can make a difference, me, myself, and I. So um, I think of it as being like a freshman in college when you come in and you're just full of piss and vinegar and you know what's right and you're going to come in and be the master of that campus. And it can be really humbling because oftentimes um, we need the naivete of the page in the world, but oftentimes um, they don't really feel like they have much power and they uh, often feel misunderstood. And so the page of swords, swords being in my mind, the path towards the enlightened mind, communicating with clarity and kindness. Um, I don't, I I don't know my great grandmother Esther enough to know whether or not this page of swords really applies to her. But when I think about my relationship to her and I put this card in there and I've got this quilt on my lap, I think about even like my excitement for this ancestral healing business. In my mind, if everybody would do this work, the world would be better. And we wouldn't have confusion about our family dynamics. And look how easy it is. If everybody just did this work, it would be okay. Uh, Which I can see that there's some fallacy in that because this work isn't not everybody's ready for this work, right? Um, When I asked the cards for what's hidden underneath that, I pulled the emperor, which actually kind of helps some of this make sense. Sometimes I literally put them like this so I can sort of like feel the emperor underneath the page of swords. Because when I think about that, I think about perhaps my energy and enthusiasm in this way for when I take on projects like this is how I assert myself in this world and how I say this is my territory, not being territorial at all, but like this is what I do and this is who I am and this is how I am. And I have um, a strong command of my sense of self that I don't know that my great grandmother ever had the opportunity to have. Maybe she only felt it sitting at a quilting frame with her quilting friends. Maybe that was how she defined herself. Maybe doing this ancestral work is, you know, I love sewing, right? It's not the only thing that I do. Maybe all of the projects that I do, that way to express myself creatively is my form of my emperor work you know, getting in my body, being out in the world, planting gardens, 
um, you know, um, traveling and seeing the world and getting to know people. And, you know, that's my kingdom. <laughs> that is the kingdom that I oversee is these relationships and these, um, you know, ways of being. I'm a cancer, right? Uh, I find this interesting. My mom is an Aries. And so, um, and like all of my best friends are Aries. So I have a lot of emperor in my life. And um, maybe some of that strength comes from some of these women who um, were not granted as much space. I've got so much more space than any female ancestor in my family tree has ever been allowed. What do I want to fill that space with? Lastly, what's the medicine or teacher of the moment? Um, an ace of cups. This is so special to have a beginner's card right here on this uh, teacher, the, in the teacher slot. Um, so when I read cups, I read it towards uh, as uh, the freedom from codependency. So the entire cups journey from ace to king is how do we love in a way that is not conditional? How do we love with open hands and open hearts and open minds? How do we keep things simple rather than make them so complicated? And um, when I think about this as applied to Esther and this quilt, with every end is a new beginning. You know, I finished this quilt. There are new beginnings in this ancestral journey for me that I can't even see right now. But what's really important to me is that I reach out to it. The, the most important thing with any ACE card is that this is not something coming to you. This is you stepping out towards reaching towards something that is right in front of you. So extending my arms to make this workshop with you, to work with Tiffany next week, to talk about ancestral healing and to be spreading this magic in the world. And it's not just for nothing. This ancestral healing work, I think, is how we free ourselves from some of these burdens that we carry. We, it's like, oh, well, this is just how things, this is how we do things in our family. Well, I got this from my, from my ancestor and I can't do anything about it because that's just how it is. You can change the story. I can change the story. You know, this Ace of Cups energy is very much like, let's start a new relationship with either these people who have come before us, the people we maybe have long histories with, but are, have, have difficult relationships with, or maybe the current people we have in our lives and we have healthy relationships with. How do we bring even more of our authentic selves into those spaces with honesty and vulnerability and um, you know, real sense of care? You can't have any type of Ace of Cups without a deep sense of self-care and self-reverence and um, you know, again, I don't do this ancestry work for the ancestors. I do it for me. Because if I can heal the, the, if I can do this work, my kids can watch it. They can watch me work on this. They can watch, they can snuggle up with it. They can, they might not even be able to verbalize what it means to be part of this tree yet, but they're not supposed to, they're kids, right? But that what an amazing offering I'm giving them, what an amazing journey I'm helping them start on by starting it myself. So I truly hope and pray that this message comes to you wherever you are and you are feeling well loved and cared for. Please reach out. I would be honored to do one-on-one -on -one work with you. We can do tarot readings. We could do ancestry coaching. Um, again, you can find me at don'tfearthedeathcard.com. I work with folks over uh, like a six month period of time. If you want to really have somebody hold your hand while you go through the ancestors, the well and chosen ones, go through some of those sticky ones, um, get some assignments about what to do the next time you go on vacation. Tiffany and I are going to talk about an assignment I gave her on her most recent ancestry trip to Galveston. Um, I'm your gal. Um, I think that this work is too precious to do alone. So no matter how you do it, make sure you share it with loved ones and people who make you feel safe. Okay. I'm Addie Broyles. It's been a pleasure. I'll talk to you soon.